Good morning. We're about to get started, so if everyone would take a seat, that would be great. Good morning, and I'm Russell King. And I'm Elizabeth Doherty. And welcome to the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law's Symposium, The Energy Transition. Climate change is an internationally recognized threat with 29% of the United States greenhouse gas emissions coming from the energy sector alone. By shifting the current electric system to cleaner generating sources, we can address and possibly eliminate more than a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. Although such a shift is both possible and necessary, it is important to also respect the economy, acknowledge the division of federal and state jurisdiction and acknowledge national security and reliability concerns. And it's going to take all of us. Here today, we have professors and students and practicing attorneys. We have legislators, we have regulators, and we have members of the industry. Above all, we have a group of concerned citizens that want to see an energy system in harmony with the environment. Because it takes all of us, we thank you all for being here today. These panels have been designed to stimulate discussion. So please, as you're watching the presentations, jot down any questions you may have and bring them up to the microphones during the Q&A session following each panel. There's also been one slight change to the program. Our moderators for panels one and two have been switched. So moderating panel one will now be Jeannie Oliver and moderating panel two is Kevin Jones. Without, ver excuse me, without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor John Echeverria, who is our faculty advisor. Thank you and welcome to the transition. So I'm one of the additional warm-up acts. Um, so welcome, let me add my voice to the welcome. This is a great turnout for 8.30 in the morning and I know that the crowd will swell during the day. Um, I bring regrets from our, our new dean, Thomas McHenry, who uh, wanted to be here uh, and, and welcome you. Uh, but he felt uh, compelled uh, to join the California Environmental Bar uh, at its annual uh, meeting in Yosemite National Park. I, I don't know why he's not here, but he, he, he couldn't be here. Um, congratulations in particular to Jay Crowder and all the editors of VGL for putting this together, uh, to Russell King and to Elizabeth Doherty for their uh, tireless efforts to recruit a great uh, panel of speakers. Uh, and for recruiting this wonderful audience. Thank you to all the speakers in advance for all the wonderful remarks you will offer. Um, I wanna just quickly acknowledge some of the faculty who have contributed so much to this behind the scenes. Um, our uh, Energy uh, Institute, uh, led by Kevin Jones, Michael Dworkin, Jeannie Oliver, and Mark James. Um, other members of the faculty, including Steve Dykus and Pat Parento, um, also helped um, behind the scenes in um, putting this program together. Um, so uh, I'm about done. I'm going to turn this over to Pat Parento, who is known to many of you. He is sort of the, uh, the guy who's going to get you all revved up and, and, and give you enough energy to sustain participation throughout the day. Uh, Pat is a professor here at Vermont Law School. He was formerly the head of our Environmental Law Center. Uh, he was the commissioner of the Envi Department of Environmental Conservation here in Vermont. He was the regional general counsel. and. Uh, earlier in his career, he was an eco-warrior. I mean, he was an attorney um, with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, so just one last point of privilege. Let me just say that uh, in this era of incredible inanity uh, and uh, stupidity uh, in public discourse, it is such a privilege to be able to have a thoughtful, intelligent, uh, respectful conversation here at Vermont Law School in this great little state. Without further ado, I turn it over to Pat Parento with a warning that you have 22 minutes. Thank you. Yes, and the respectful conversation will begin immediately after my remarks. So why are we here, right? Energy transition. What's that all about? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's about the fact that we've just seen four of the most powerful hurricanes we've ever experienced in one hurricane season and we're not done yet. Maybe it's about the fact that some of these hurricanes started out as category one and two and ended up category five within hours as they crossed the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf. I don't know, maybe it's because Houston experienced 50 inches of rainfall in one event. 
And a storm that wouldn't leave. It went offshore and came back and sat there and sat there and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. I don't know, maybe it's because Hurricane Maria tore a path through the Caribbean and left a humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico that still isn't anywhere close to being under control and resolved. I don't know, maybe it's because over 40 people have died in wildfires spreading across California, and we don't know how many more there may be. I don't know, maybe it's because some scientists have said the West Antarctic ice shield is in irreversible decline and melt. Maybe it's because Greenland is breaking apart. It's not melting like a cube of ice on a stove. It's breaking apart. It's coming apart. Maybe it's because ocean acidification is thinning the shells of oysters off the shore of Washington and Oregon to the point where billions of oyster spats are dying every year. I don't know. Maybe it's because the Gulf of Maine is now the warmest body of water on Earth. And the lobsters are beginning to go north to Canada, which Canada is all too happy to receive. Right, Mark? I don't know. You know, it's like Al Gore said, it, it, the evening news is, is, is like a, a, a trip through the book of Revelations. It's happening everywhere we look, every day. Storms on steroids. What's the steroids? Us. CO2, greenhouse gases. Let me think. Does that have something to do with energy? Might. Energy transition. How long does it take to transition an enemy energy system? Well, Vaclav Smil, you know, one of the gurus of energy, engineering, technology, economics, institutional capacity, says 50 years. Really? 50 years. You think we have 50 years? Think again. Where are we? Well, we're at 410 parts per million in the atmosphere with CO2, 410 parts per million. 400 was sort of one of these sort of uh, whoop, 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 warning signs. We're past that. We've burned through over half of the carbon budget that the IPCC fifth assessment says we can afford to put into the atmosphere before we cross the relatively safe Footnote, not really safe. Boundary of two degrees Celsius increase. We're already at one C with a baked in half C already in the system yet to be realized. The scientists say we've got to keep, I don't know, something on the order of 80% of known fossil fuel reserves right where they are, in place, unextracted, unburned. That is, if you want to have a 66% chance of maybe holding global temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius, 66% chance. I don't know, what does a 4 degree C world look like? Because you see, that's the path we're on. That's the path we're on with Paris. No changes or modest tinkering. That's the path we're on. Now, I'm not going to be here to see that with you. You'll see that, many of you in the room. And you can begin to imagine what that four degrees C world looks like. And you can begin to imagine, well, hell. We'll just adapt. We're pretty clever creatures, aren't we? We'll just adapt. Tell that to the citizens, the American citizens of Puerto Rico, Barbuda, Virgin Islands, Maldives, Kivalina, Louisiana, Miami Beach, the Everglades. Tell them how to adapt to four degrees Celsius. Or let's not do that. Let's not do that. 
let's, let's not only get to zero emission before 2050. Let's get to negative emissions before the end of the century. L let's not only stop putting steroids in the atmosphere, let's start replacing, restoring, reassembling nature, the greatest defense we have against out of control, autopilot climate disruption, forests, soils, mangrove swamps, seagrasses, vegetation, nature. So here's the thing. There is no technological impediment to doing that. There is no economic impeditive impediment to doing that. Oh, there are challenges, big challenges, biggest challenges we've ever faced. Maybe not doable, but we won't know unless we try. So that's what today is. Today is getting serious. Right here, right now, to the person who's sitting in your seat. I love that line. I stole it. Um, good news everywhere. Good news breaking out like you can't imagine. Solar prices declining by 80%. You've got all the experts here to tell you all about the details. Solar and wind booming, fastest growing ever. Solar economy producing six times more jobs than any other sector of the American economy. California reauthorizing AB 32. Massachusetts adopting a cap and trade program. Regional greenhouse gas initiative upping their ante, lowering their cap, increasing their price control so the price actually starts making a difference in the market. On and on and on and on. Technology everywhere. Have you ever heard of Elon Musk? Do you think he's going to electrify? The transportation system, I'll bet on him. I won't bet on Secretary Perry, but I'll bet on Elon Musk. Yeah, so where's that electricity going to come from? Yeah, good question. And do we need storage? Yeah, I suppose we need some storage. Is, is that a problem? Yeah, is it a big problem? No. No. It's not a big problem. Solvable problem. So this day is all about problem solving, solutions, good news, exciting news, innovation, good jobs, wealth creation, wealth distribution, equity, fairness, American leadership. We could use some. But it's going to come from this room. It's going to come from you all. And then I'm going to leave. But before I go, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, I've known Dan Riker for quite a while. Uh, I'm even older than he is. It, here's what I'll tell you about Dan. It is not fair that one person should have so much talent, so much breadth, so much depth, so much experience in so many areas, law, Policy, technology, finance, economics, politics, academia. He was, for eight years, the Assistant Secretary of Energy for efficiency. What's the question? And renewables. He led a transforma transformative, really, program for the Department of Energy, which is sort of Hardly known for taking risks and bold thinking, but that is Dan. That's, that's what Dan's all about. And then he went to Google, headed up their climate and energy program. And Google's been, as you know, a real leader. Walking the talk, funding innovation, demonstrating innovation, building platforms, breaking through obstacles and barriers to wide-scale deployment, scaling up of renewables and efficiency all over the world. And then Dan thought, I'm going to go out and start my own company and prove that this stuff can actually 
work. And he did. Hey, and here's a tip. He's doing it again. So when you get the chance, ask him what this newfangled technology about deep ocean wind turbine generation is all about. You might get in on a new IPO. You never know. So now he's at Stanford. Decent school, not a bad school, uh, where he's heading up their energy uh, program. He's got dual appointment to the energy uh, uh, school and the law school. Uh, if there was a theology school, he'd probably get an appointment there too. Um, he's got a really varied career, NRDC, Department of Justice. He's, a, he's actually a real lawyer, uh, but that's really the least of what he is. He's, he's an awful lot more than that. Um, he's terrific. And when he, you know, isn't changing the world for the better and improving the lives of people everywhere, he likes to kayak. And, uh, uh, you know, I kayak. I kayak Miller Pond, right? Um, he kayaked the entire length of the Rio Grande River. And because that, you know, didn't pose such an obstacle, he decided to do the same thing with the Yangtze River in China. So it is indeed my great pleasure to welcome back Dan Riker. Can you hear me in the back? It works. Pat Parento, thank you so much. What an inspirational opening. Um, and thank you for your kind introduction of me. What my wife says is I can't keep a job. <laughs> so that's the real story. Uh, but I am so thrilled to be among so many people who are such good friends here. It starts with Pat. Um, but um, Steve Dykus, who I worked with long ago at the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, Peter Bradford, who I've known for years and years, who's on the faculty here as well, um, Michael Dworkin, Michael will be here later, known for years and years, and I actually have a boss, an old boss in the room, Tony Roisman. I didn't know Tony was here. I didn't know he's heading up, he's chairing the Vermont Public Service Board, the, the Public Utility Commission here. I worked for him as a lowly paralegal at the Justice Department, I don't know, 75 or 80 years ago, Tony, it must have been, something like that. Yeah, and, uh, and then I also want to thank Russell King and Elizabeth Doherty for helping me get here and helping to put on this whole wonderful event. You guys have been great, and I appreciate it. I didn't get too lost getting here this morning. It's also great to be back in Vermont. Um, I lived over in Norwich uh, not too many years ago, still have a home up in the Mad River Valley, and uh, have some unusual things that happened to me and my family here, which I will get to in a moment. So my job this morning is not to talk about solar and wind and all those good things, which I do love, but to talk about the real workhorse in all of this, which is energy efficiency. And, and I'd like to do that uh, for about 40 minutes and then, and then take your questions. Any that you have, um, any good jokes, I'm looking for whatever you have. So let's, let's dive in. So Pat put it well. Um, we have storms on steroids. The future is, in fact, not what it used to be. And you need only look at Houston, or Florida, or the real sadness in Puerto Rico to kind of get a sense about what we're up to right now. And of course, it all does come back to our global carbon footprint. We can debate how big a cause, all of those sorts of things that the scientists are, are debating. But when it comes right down to it, the emissions that we're seeing from carbon are having a profound effect. And the three biggest emitters are China, the US, and India. We are the heel. We are the heel in this diagram. I'm not sure how the, they picked that for our position. but And then there's much of the rest of the world that makes this up. But this is kind of the root cause of so much of what we're seeing. 
It also, though, creates the great opportunity, and that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. There is an extraordinary opportunity in going out and not just transitioning our energy system, but fundamentally rebuilding it in so many different ways. So if the future is not what it used to be, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that's what I find so exciting about this, this moment that we find ourselves in. There is a lot of doom and gloom, but there's an extraordinary opportunity to basically build the future that we want in the energy area, in this energy transition, as you're calling it today. This is not how we're going to get there. For those of you who can't read it, <laughs> sorry, Harold, but I'm reducing our carbon footprint. That's, that's the way we're not going to get to a clean energy future. Nor from the academy is this it. Whoops. Then a miracle occurs. These are two Stanford or Vermont Law School professors talking to each other. In fact, how we're going to get there, in my view, is this. This is my favorite triangle. There is a rumor at Stanford I have this tattooed on my back. I will not either confirm nor deny that this morning. But if we're going to build a more sustainable energy future, it's about technology, policy, and finance. And technology is science, technology, engineering. Policy is law, policy, and all those related areas. And finance is economics, marketing, business, finance, you name it. But these are how I've crystallized these. What I say to friends, colleagues, students is, if you're interested in this whole area, get good at one point of this triangle, but do not ignore the other two. I've seen so many people invent technologies all over this country, really interesting, compelling technologies, but stumble in the law and policy world, find themselves unable to raise early stage capital or down the road from there to secure project finance to actually get full scale deployment of a technology. We've got to integrate across this triangle. And as you go out into the world as students, you might be here, but but be sure you have some understandings about those other two points if you want to work in this whole area of sustainable energy. So I am going to walk you around this triangle with respect to energy efficiency and then, and then, take, your, then take your questions. So just a few fundamentals, because I understand there's some folks who don't come directly from the energy world. Some of you come from the environmental law world. So I just wanted to talk about a few things that will set the stage a little bit for my talk, but also for today. The first is, no surprise, energy sources evolve over time. We were a largely wood or biomass powered world. This is, goes all the way back to, to the 1800s. Coal came in, pushing a big amount of that biomass out. From there, we went to oil. Natural gas came in. The era of hydro began to take some piece of this. Nuclear arrived. And then that small little thing up there called other renewables. This is a chart from 2010. It would be a bigger slice today, and it's a fast-growing one. Still not huge, but a fast-growing one. So this is kind of the evolution. And I want to tell you, you're sitting in a state that I think was the birthplace of modern renewable energy. 75 years ago, last October, the first megawatt-scale wind turbine in the world first wind turbine hooked up to a large-scale utility grid was built on a mountain called Grandpa's Knob in southern Vermont. It's a great, great story. There's a book you ought to read called Power from the Wind, written in 1946. The plan with this, but for World War II. This was put up in 1941. The plan was to put another 10 or 15 turbines along the ridge of the Green Mountains, and I would make the case that we would be 30 or 40 years further ahead in the wind industry had that happened, World War II intervened, coal came in in a much bigger way, the nuclear era began, and we didn't get back to a megawatt scale wind turbine until the 1970s. It was a brilliant team that put this together, and uh, it was an interesting fork in the road when it comes to the history of energy technology. And now we're going to see, I am involved with a, a floating offshore wind company, we're not only putting turbines on the bottom in shallow water. We're now beginning to put turbines in deep water, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles offshore. This is this 50, 60, 70 year evolution of technology that Pat rightly said, we got to speed up. The good news is, though, a lot of this is speeding up. And this is one of those in the North Sea off the coast of Norway in a hurricane, does very well. And I can tell you about that later if anyone's interested. 
full-scale project now being built off the coast of Scotland. Very deep water, massive winds. And the best offshore wind resource in the United States is off the coast of California, the deep water, and in the Great Lakes. Who would have thought? So that's a little bit about technology transition. Don't get too scared about this chart. This is the ultimate wiring chart of US energy consumption. Put together annually, I recommend it to you if you really want to understand where energy goes in our economy in the US. So you start with petroleum. Most of it goes into transportation. Some of it goes into industrial use. Literally none of it, almost none of it, goes into electricity production. We don't make electricity from oil in this country anymore. Natural gas, on the other hand, goes into the industrial sector, the commercial sector, residential sector, and we make a lot of electricity. Take nuclear, all goes into electricity, none goes into these other sectors of the economy. So it, it's the wiring diagram. Why do I show you all this? Well, first I think it's important to understand where these different sources go in our economy. But the second is, of all this energy that goes in, 100 quadrillion BTUs, or 100 quads, a little under 40 comes out as useful energy. And guess what? The other 60 comes out as rejected energy, the energy we waste. That's why we're talking about energy efficiency. 100 quads of energy in, 40 out, performing useful work, and 60 gets thrown away. That's why energy efficiency is so important in our economy, and why, yes, solar, yes, wind, yes, all the renewables, but we got to start with energy efficiency. For climate, we need all of this. Renewables, carbon capture, changing the fuels in power plants, end use fuel switching. And then this big one, the biggest one of all at 38%, according to the International Energy Agency, that's energy efficiency. The brown segments here are where energy efficiency makes up big chunks of what we got to get done. Efficiency is needed in industry. It's needed in transportation. It's needed in our buildings. And it's needed in a host of other sorts of things. So energy is the big dog in all of this when it comes to this energy transition. And I think that's why we're starting out with energy efficiency this morning. The good news regarding EE, or energy efficiency, is it's our lowest cost resource. It's cheaper than wind or natural gas or all of these other things. These are the standard kind of cost numbers that one of the big investment banks in New York, Lazard, puts together on a regular basis. And look where energy efficiency comes out. This is in cents per kilowatt hour. This is the cheap stuff. So what do we say? We say efficiency first. And I love what Emery Lovins has to say about all people want is cold beer and hot showers. We want the services energy provides. If we can do it with less energy, we're going to save in our pocketbook. We're going to save in a climate context. So we want the services. And the less we can provide those services, the less energy, the better off we're going to be. Another complicated chart, but this is the famous McKinsey curve for what the cheap and the expensive stuff is when you're going to fix climate change. This is all the cheap stuff, the low cost and, in fact, in many ways, negative cost. Insulation, fuel efficient vehicles, lighting, air conditioning, water heating. It doesn't get much more boring than that, but this is, this is the important stuff when it comes to energy efficiency. And I want to focus for a second on lighting. This is, of course, the LED. This is the highly efficient technology developed decades ago, but now coming into its own. These are those old-fashioned incandescent bulbs. Lumens per watt is how we measure light per unit of power. Very inefficient, 13 to 18 lumens. Compact fluorescence, those curly ones, somewhere in the 55 to 70 lumens per watt. And LEDs, in the old days, couldn't really beat compact fluorescence, but now they're rising. The amount of light you get out for the amount of energy you put in gets better and better and better. And the great news is they used to be extremely expensive, LEDs, but they've come down radically in cost. I was at a hardware store a couple months ago, and it was a real, for, a, for an energy nerd like myself, it was exciting to go in and see that I could buy four LEDs for the same price as buying four old-fashioned 
old fashioned. Um, incandescence, the same price. You would have gone into a hardware store not too many years ago and they would have been five or six or eight times as expensive. So this has become not only a great technology, but a cheap one. So I owned a house over in Norwich, Vermont, and I guess John F. Echeverria almost bought this house, it turns out, and I learned about another energy technology called the blower door test. What the heck is that? Well, houses in cold and hot places leak a lot of energy if they're not well insulated, and what you do is you essentially put a giant fan in the door and you blow air out, having sealed up the whole house, closing off everything. So this guy comes over and he does the blower door test. 20 or 30 minutes later, he comes back and he says, you know, I've never had a house that failed this test so miserably. He said, I can't get this thing to depressurize at all because you depressurize it and then all the cold air starts coming in and you can uh, identify it with all sorts of things. He says, I can't get this to do anything. Now the rule is the auditor will need to close all exterior doors and windows, open all interior doors, close any fireplace, dampers, doors, and wood stove, air inlets. We did everything, but he couldn't get it done. I said, what do we do? He said, I don't know. He came back a half an hour later though, and he said, how many chimneys do you think you have in this house? I said, two. He said, well, actually you got a third. He discovered a third chimney, and for the last 70 years, it was open just leaking all of the heat in the house. And we finally knew why this house was so cold and so expensive. And I said, is it a big job to fix it? He said, no. Five minutes, bunch of insulation and some foam, and it was done. So some of this stuff is really cheap and really effective. So if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. This is Lord Kelvin, as in the Kelvin scale. We call this ET meets IT, energy technology meets information technology. This is a very exciting area. It's something we spent a lot of time at Google on. There's lots of startup companies, lots of big companies. We developed something called the Google Power Meter. Our tagline was knowledge is less power. And we gave people real-time information on their kitchen counter with a little meter uh, what was going on every moment of the day. My then seven-year-old ran down one morning and I, he said, how does this work? I said, go put some bread in the toaster and make some toast. And he saw the thing shoot up. And he ran all over the house, turning things on and off, running down to the kitchen. And I swear, after about 20 minutes, he knew more about energy use in a home than about 95% of Americans. This thing kind of worked. Unfortunately, many other people thought it as well. Began using Google Power Meter yesterday, time to buy a more efficient clothes dryer today. Unfortunately, Google did not go ahead, but the good news is there's lots have argued that they could have saved 2.9 billion had we gone on with power meter, but that's another story for another day. All right, there is one energy number people do know, <laughs> one energy number we all know and people really focus on, and that's the cost of gasoline. I know this for a very peculiar reason, because my third child was born at a Shell station on a cold day in April in Waterbury, Vermont. We made it to the hospital, the doctor sent us home, we drove 50 miles home, we went, we had to go back and we didn't make it. So, every year, we go back to this same gas station and take his picture <laughs> as he grows up. His nickname is indeed Carson. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So what's been not driving our improvement in automobile fuel economy for years has been the, the cafe requirement. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But we are finally now, as many of you know, on a path where, as a result of regulations set in the Obama administration, we're on our way to 54 and a half miles per gallon from where we were stuck at about 27 miles per gallon for years and years and years. How are we going to get there? This is not going to be the answer. 
much as some people like to think that you could do this, but in fact, it's cars like this. You know, everybody's favorite Prius. Chevy now with not only the Volt, but the Bolt is now out. You know, $35,000, 220 mile range. This is a big, big deal. And of course, everybody's favorite car in California, the, the, the Tesla. This is the S, but coming soon is the three also 35,000, we put in, we put our thousand dollars down. We are number 278,451 on the list. Sometime between now and 2020, we may get this car, but I'll have to tell you, I'm a little nervous about this car. This is the dashboard. There are no dials on the dashboard. And I said to my kids, how am I going to drive this thing? I got to keep doing this. They said, you'll figure it out. So we'll see. Anyway, the great thing about these plug-in cars is that they can integrate themselves with the grid, not only taking electricity from the grid, but sending electricity back to the grid. And at Google, we did some early work on this two-way flow of electricity between a plug-in vehicle and the electric grid. And why would that be interesting? Well, you know, on a day when the, we're, we're facing brownouts in California, the too much of a draw from the grid as a result of serious air conditioning load. If you've signed up some of those cars, you could say, you know that power that, uh, that, power that you bought for four cents a kilowatt hour? Um, we'd like some of that, and we'll pay you three times what you paid. Send that back to us. And you can, you can move this in two directions, and that's what's very exciting about this whole opportunity with plug-in vehicles. So. Where does this take us? Not to tomorrow's smart grid, and we actually used to talk about tomorrow's smart grid, but we really are looking at today's smart grid with renewables, advanced transmission, transmission and distribution, an increasingly smart home with the sort of metering that I talked about, and then a plug-in vehicle. All of this is here today. All of this is rapidly advancing. Lots of small companies and big companies in this, in this game and moving forward quite smartly. So, Policy. That was a quick run through technology. Now let's get to the next point of the triangle. And I don't, I'm not going to use an energy efficiency uh, example. I'm going to use a, a wind example. Policy really, really, really does matter, as most of you in this room knows, when it comes to energy and environment. This is a chart of the wind production tax credit. This is the tax credit that has driven wind deployment in the United States since the 1990s. When it's in place, we see substantial wind deployment. When it expires, as it regularly does, we see massive drops. And the biggest was in 2012. 13,000 megawatts built in 2012. The credit expired. And look where we ended up at about 1,000. So policy really matters. We fortunately moved forward in 2015, and as some of you know, both the solar tax credit and the wind tax credit were extended over five years, but the wind tax credit is now coming down. But that's a predictable decline. That's the way it was set by Congress. It wasn't a one-year authorization. So policy really can make a big difference, and I always have thought this is a, quite, a, quite a visible example of that. So I want to talk about two issues regarding energy efficiency, and in the policy context, that is low consumer demand. In the finance context, that is investor concerns about risk. I think these are the two fundamental problems that we face with energy efficiency today. So let's talk about those. This is fundamentally a demand challenge. This comes from a building energy efficiency specialist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. People just don't care that much about their energy use. You've got to solve a problem people feel like they have. And I really think that's one of the things we're up against when it comes to selling this cheap energy resource called energy efficiency, our cheapest energy resource. Now, President Obama did think that insulation is sexy stuff. I kind of love that quote. I started to talk about it. But most people do not think that insulation is sexy stuff. Our current president, well, I won't go into that. All right. So let me ask you, what's cooler? The Vermont house with solar panels or the high efficiency furnace in your basement? Yeah. I mean, 
this is a fundamental problem. If I could get solar panels on my house, boy, that would be exciting. I'd, I'd love to do that. I'll struggle to do that. I'll go online. A high efficiency furnace? It doesn't get much more boring than that. And I say that because I think this is one of our problems in selling energy efficiency. And we're up against this across pretty much the entire range of energy efficiency technologies. So we owned a house in Washington, DC. And when I was in the Clinton administration, I decided it was time to walk, walk the talk. So we did a renovation. We did a green renovation of this house in 1998. We did all of the sort of things you need to do. We put in a high efficiency, a SEER 15 air conditioner. We redid the furnace. We put in insulation, all of that. But the cool part of it were the solar panels on the back. And you know, we got to write a piece for the Washington Post about it, about back then, in the late 90s, actually selling power back to the local power company. Um, so I got a taste that you know, when it comes to the press, when it comes to a whole host of people, this is the exciting stuff. I will tell you, we had a two and a half foot snowstorm in DC one night, six months after these panels were put in. I heard a big boom on the roof, and I went out the next morning, and the entire solar system had collapsed. It had the wrong rack, and it was destroyed, and my insurance agent said he had never heard of solar power before. So that was my six month first, first experience with solar on the roof. So, on we go. One of the answers to this is psychology and behavior. And there's a whole group of people out in the world, an annual conference earlier this month, looking at the relationship between behavior and energy use. I'm not going to talk about this, but I do recommend this whole area to you if you really want to dig into the kind of some of the psychological and behavioral barriers we've got to moving energy efficiency forward. What I do want to quickly go through um, are some of the policy tools to stimulate energy efficiency demand. There's a whole set of tools we've put in place at the federal, state, and local level to stimulate energy efficiency. It was a recognition decades ago that energy efficiency wasn't going to sell itself very readily. So let's walk through these. The first are federal energy efficiency standards. This is the, the unsung workhorse of federal energy policy, federal climate policy. This is a long-standing program at the Department of Energy, now covering more than 60 products, a huge percentage of residential energy use, as well as fairly substantial commercial and industrial. Things like washing machines, refrigerators, air conditioning, pumps and motors, the efficiency of an electric motor, the efficiency of a pump. This is also really boring stuff, but this is really gets deeply into energy use in this country. The savings over time as a result of these many standards have been very substantial. Remember, we use 100 quadrillion BTUs in the US economy. This is what we've saved is well over one year of overall energy use, and 7 billion metric tons, more than what we annually emit in terms of carbon dioxide, so over the life of these standards. The legal basis, these go way back to the 1975 Energy Policy Act, and the key is the Secretary of Energy sets them. They have to be determined to be both technologically feasible and economically justified. Technologically feasible and economically justified. Those are the two prongs, and we battle over that when each of these standards gets set. There is a very elaborate process for setting these standards, it generally takes three or four years. There can be litigation. But there's a lot of analytical work that gets done, looking at all sorts of impacts, manufacturing impacts, consumer impacts, emissions-related impacts. There's a regulatory impact. You put out a NOPER, as you know, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, lots of comments, and these get, these get adopted. So I had the honor of setting the 2001 US standard for refrigerators. And you can see where we were back in the early 70s. Those refrigerators were using almost 2,000 kilowatt hours a year on average in the United States. 
And as a result of this standard, we were down at about 500. Now, as I keep saying, this is pretty boring stuff. So the Secretary of Energy at the time said we were going to do a little press conference on the release of these standards. And the Secretary at that time was a guy named Bill Richardson, the former governor of New Mexico, former UN Secretary. Uh, and he says to me, so what am I going to get up and say at this press conference? You know, who's going to write about energy efficiency of refrigerators? So I thought to myself very quickly, a few weeks earlier, President Clinton had given his final State of the Union. And the theme of that was this transition we were making from 99 into 2000. And he, he, he talked about building a bridge to the 21st century. So I thought to myself quickly, I said to the secretary, why don't you get up and announce that we're building a fridge to the 21st century? <laughs> It was the quote of the week in Newsweek. It was my greatest day as a bureaucrat, by far. So a few weeks later, we had to do a press conference on an even more boring subject, which is washing machines. So he says, Riker, what am I going to say at this one? And I thought fast. I said, well, Mr. Secretary, why don't you announce that we're, that we're agitating for change? He said, no, you do that one. <laughs> so. I showed you this chart, and these are these federal standards. I want to point out very quickly, because we'll come back to this in a few minutes, the actual original standards didn't come from the federal government. They came from the state of California. I also want to point out that the volume of these refrigerators has gone up. The price, the 2014, has gone down. So we're building bigger refrigerators. They hold more stuff. And they cost less than they used to cost. And they now talk to us. I mean, these refrigerators that have all sorts of smart features. I'm not so sure about that feature, but all right. So that's, that's one thing that we do. The second are these yellow energy guides, which I'm sure you've seen. This came early. Um, one of the early laws, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, basically said to the Federal Trade Commission, at least tell people how much energy all these appliances and equipment use. And that's the yellow energy tag. Again, getting people engaged, getting them more interested in energy use. This was the bigger one that came out of the EPA in 1992. Based on all the DOE data, we started to put the Energy Star label on the more efficient appliances and equipment. And this might be 20 or 30 percent better than the average. It might be the top 5 percent. There's various ways it gets measured. And we now also have an Energy Star Buildings program, the most highly efficient. So again, giving people some motivation, highlighting things that do better. Now, going to the state level, there's also a whole set of energy efficiency building codes that have been put in place over many decades by the American National Standards Institute and the, the, the Heating, Refrigerating, and Cooling Association, and the 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 white are states that haven't done anything on this in terms of energy efficiency codes. These are building codes. The, the, the dark greens are the ones that are having, using the most advanced codes, and the, the sort of brown are kind of middle tier. You could spend an entire career on this, and people do, but these codes have helped a lot when it comes to buildings and making sure that they're energy efficient. And the, some of the states have been real leaders. We also have energy efficiency resource standards. This is kind of the energy efficiencies version of a renewable portfolio standard or renewable energy standard. Um, again, fair number of states. Some of these are combined with the renewable portfolio standards that have been adopted in various states. Some have been set by public utility commissions. Some have been set by state legislatures. The darker the color, the more the energy reduction on an annual basis. Uh, so again, another approach to this. And this says to utilities, as you go out and do your work providing electricity in a state, we want you to work to cut energy use. Going from the state to the city level, there are now a variety of cities around the US DC, Austin, Washington, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and the, actually the entire state of California that has adopted what are called 
energy benchmarking and disclosure. This is essentially a system where commercial building owners have to become transparent about the energy use in their commercial buildings. So it says to people out looking for commercial space, you're moving into either a, an efficient or an inefficient one. It sets up some competitive juices among commercial building owners. There's a whole host of things that this can drive. So again, highlighting the energy efficiency situation that we find ourselves in in commercial buildings, particularly in big cities. And this is maybe my favorite. So any of you who've bought a home know that you go through an appraisal, and then you go through mortgage underwriting. They, they see what you can qualify for when you go out to get a loan to purchase the house. Home appraisals typically look at all these things. Termites, paint, lead paint, soil, you know, is it going to slip down a hillside, health and safety, water and sewage. But strangely, haven't looked at energy use in a house, typically. Similarly, when you go to get a mortgage, they want to make sure you can pay the monthly mortgage. So they look at what the principal costs on the, on the loan are going to be, what the interest taxes and insurance, the taxes for the house and the insurance on the house. But interestingly, we've never looked at energy. What's it cost in a cold state like Vermont or a hot state like Arizona to actually power the house? Electricity, heating, cooling, and all of that. This is called PITI. That's a kind of a common formula. We've said, add the E to it, add energy to it and also add energy to home appraisal. So the tagline, buying an, buying an energy efficient home, get a better mortgage. Talk about motivation for people to think about energy efficiency. Remember, we're trying to sell energy efficiency to people out in the marketplace. If you knew, first of all, that home is $5,000 a year to heat, cool, and provide electricity, that one is $1,500, and you're relatively indifferent as between the two, that $3,500 difference would qualify you for a bigger mortgage because you have less of a monthly or an annual payment. So the Sensible Accounting to Value Energy Act introduced in the, the US Congress, it's in, originally in 2013, it is now in the pending Senate Energy Bill. One of the two sponsors, Senator Isaacton, a Republican from Georgia, is a former real estate agent. He got this, was not a hard sell at all. And it would basically say HUD, Housing and Urban Development, pro would provide criteria for appraisal and underwriting that would take energy savings of an efficient home into account based on a qualified energy report. So this would be injected into the federally regulated system of mortgages and underwriting and you would get this cranked into the system. Again, how do you get people to take a greater interest in efficiency than they normally do? Now, of course, the new factor when it comes to this whole policy realm, obviously, this is a big question mark, where we're headed. But I wanted to very quickly mention these three, the big three US energy standards and where we find ourselves. The first, of course, as most of you know, is the P Clean Power Plan. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but this is, this is the big one that's, that's very much at risk right now. This is the CAFE standard. On our way, as I said, to 54 and a half miles per gallon by 2025, this, I think, is the single biggest environmental accomplishment of the Obama administration, getting EPA and the Department of Transportation to sit down with the Detroit automakers and work out that very steep green line, and they got it done. But they agreed to a kind of a mid-course review, which is what's happening right now. President Obama, before he left, set this up well, and we probably would have continued on that path. But the Trump administration has pulled back from that. And this is very much a question mark, whether we're going to continue on to 54 and a half miles per gallon. And coming back to this, the federal energy efficiency standards. 
through thick and thin, Democratic and Republican administrations back to the 1970s have been putting out these standards, the little engine they could. But there's a real risk that we now have an administration that won't. These have to come out of DOE, as I said, and then they have to be reviewed by OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. And there's a real risk that the many standards that are pending, several of which are actually required standards, are not going to find their way out of the US federal government. And that would be a real shame, because this is kind of the unsung energy efficiency success story of the US federal government. All right. California to the rescue, sixth largest economy in the world, an aggressive climate program, a 50% RPS, we may well move to 100%, and even independent climate agreements with other states and nations. Governor Brown and the Premier of China reached an agreement in June on climate change. But here's what I wanted to quickly focus on. California both has independent authority for energy efficiency standards, and independent authority for fuel economy standards, the two things we just talked about. So remember I told you, California actually was ahead of the federal government, ahead of federal regulation, so actually has independent authority that it could continue to assert even if the Trump administration puts a big X through the current DOE Energy Efficiency Standards Program. And, a number of states are following California's lead on the corporate average fuel economy because, again, California was there earlier. So we may see, we are seeing, even if the Trump administration does not continue on this 54 and a half mile per gallon path, we may well see California and this group of states continue. I was speaking in Minnesota a few weeks ago they are not on this list, and there's a, big, there's a big debate there about whether Minnesota ought to sign up for the same uh, agreement with the same authority. All right, final stop on our tour around my favorite triangle. Let's talk about finance. Don't get nervous. You can handle this. <laughs> Where did my coffee go? I lost it. Anyway, all right. Here are some really, really, really important numbers. This is what we are spending globally on all clean energy, according to the International Energy Agency, the average between 2010 and 2015. $750 billion a year on all clean energy. Oh, thank you, Pat. <laughs> this is what I do best. <laughs> $750 billion a year on all clean energy globally. This is not just solar and wind. This is all of the zero carbon sources, including energy efficiency and low carbon sources. This is what the International Energy Agency says we should be spending very quickly if we want to have any chance of staying within the 450 parts per million, two degrees C that, that Pat Parento talked about. We need to very quickly like right away, triple current global spending on clean energy. I used to take great comfort that there was a lot of money on the planet, that the institutional capital, as we call it, the big pension funds, insurance companies, mutual funds, sovereign wealth funds. This is like Saudi Arabia's oil fund, Norwegian's, the Norwegian's oil fund, and then lots of billionaires. The total is about $100 trillion. And I used to say, and until I met a very smart guy from Goldman Sachs, we got plenty of money. It turns out that's the wrong number. This is the right number. This is what's available annually, the investable capital, as they call it on everything globally, investment in transportation, in IT, you name it, this is the rough number that we've got to spend on everything. Set that aside, set that next to the $2.3 trillion need that I just talked about. And what you're beginning to see is what we've got to be spending on clean energy to, to have a shot at dealing with climate 
is a pretty big percentage of, of, this, of all the capital that's available annually. A complicated chart, but what the story is here, this is a breakdown of all the pension fund investments. Anyone who's got a pension fund, you've got people in New York who are out investing your pension fund, and they put it into mutual funds and government bonds and private bonds and shares of public companies. It turns out a very tiny slice of that is even available to go into energy. And it's not just an 8% slice, it's a much smaller slice of that. In part because of the risk that comes with much of the energy investing globally. What do I mean by that? We talk about four big risk categories when it comes to investing in energy projects around the world. There's policy risk emissions rules, trade policy. We've got a big mess right now in Washington that may result in a solar tariff. If you're an investor and you're looking out at the prospect of a, of a big tariff being placed on solar, you're saying to yourself, well, that's a risky investment. Low and unstable electricity prices, low and volatile natural gas and oil prices. We got cheap natural gas. What if it becomes expensive natural gas? We've got cheaper oil. What if it changes? Overgeneration and curtailment. This is, we've got a problem in California now where in certain parts of the day, certain seasons, we're producing more electricity than we can use. We are overgenerating and we are curtailing the solar and wind projects that are producing more than we can use. That does not sit well with an investor in a solar and wind project, the prospect that you may not get paid at all for some of the electricity you're producing. Now, the good news is there's opportunities for storage that are coming down the road. You can build more transmission. But all of that's complicated, and that has its own set of costs. Permitting. It's tough to get certain projects permitted in this country and a lot of places around the world. Transmission, we've used up a lot of the good transmission and interconnection sites for a lot of projects in the US, and in some countries, it's, they don't exist in the first place. And then a whole set of things, the investment regime. Unstable currencies, for example, in the developing world. You put dollars in, if you're a foreign investor, you get their currency back, what if it's volatile? Again. These are the sort of complexities that make much of the investment in clean energy projects around the world not the sort of risk that a lot of investors want to take. And it's what gets you into that pretty small slice of the pension fund pool that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Now, there's good news here. We know how to fix a lot of these things. And we have a project at Stanford that's kind of digging into each one of these investment risks and what can be done. We're working with some of the big investment banks. We're working with governments. We're working with a variety of people. How can we lower the risk that attends many of these kinds of clean energy projects? And I want to be clear. I'm not just talking about solar and wind projects. I'm talking about the rest of the renewables. I'm talking carbon capture, nuclear projects, uh, and even energy efficiency. There are a variety of challenges with energy efficiency, as we've talked about a little bit. So what happens is these four risks compound and make a desirable investment, nice tall green bar and a nice short red one. It makes the green bar drop and the red ones go up. CO2 price is unstable, electricity price is unstable, and uncertain EPC, that means an engineering procurement and construction contract. If you have a technology that's not fully ready, the contractor is going to say, sorry, it's going to cost you more to get it done. And then the debt term. You'd like a nice long-term loan of 25 years, but if you've got a risky project, the lender may say, I'll give you seven years. That raises the price. That's the bad news. The great news is this is a massive economic opportunity. We're going to spend, one way or another, about $50 trillion 
between now and 2035 on energy. And I didn't say clean energy. We're going to make that choice, how clean or not clean it is. But we're spending, going to be spending tens of trillions of dollars building and rebuilding global energy infrastructure. So it's a massive economic opportunity. And some, like the International Energy Agency, call it the biggest economic opportunity of the 21st century, bar none. The great news is that energy efficiency has nice returns and relatively low risk. So not only is it cheap, as we saw at the beginning, but among investors, it's looked at as a pretty attractive investment given its relatively low risk. You pretty much know that if you put in this advanced lighting system, it's probably going to work. And you've got a lot, of a, a lot of experience with it. And again, we saw this before, a low levelized cost of electricity. So, we're spending about $230 billion a year on energy efficiency globally. And what that original chart I showed you from the International Energy Agency says is we've got to multiply that by five or six. It's the single biggest increment of increased investment that we need if we're going to have a shot, again, at staying within that 450 degrees centigrade, 450 parts per million, two degrees centigrade. Here's an interesting example of the US efficiency opportunity. $300 billion investment opportunity. This is Deutsche Bank looked at this. A trillion dollars in energy savings over 10 years. And you could cut about 10% of US climate emissions. That's a pretty sweet deal. The capital is there in the United States, but it is not flowing. So 3% of existing commercial space is renovated each year, just one tenth include a state-of-the-art energy efficiency upgrade. And it's even lower. People, you know, the granite countertops are much more interesting than the efficient furnace. That's our, that's our basic dilemma. So this is the second issue. We talked about low consumer demand in the policy context. Let's finish up talking about investor concerns about risk. There's three kinds of risk. There's credit risk. Is the borrower, person who's borrowed the money, likely to pay you back? And that comes up in both the residential and the commercial context. Mush means municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. This is another category of investment opportunities where energy efficiency is a big deal. Asset risk. Are we going to compromise the value of the property? if we make an energy efficiency upgrade. And what the heck could I mean by that? Well, we've had experiences, for example, you tighten up a house too much, and you have indoor air quality problems. You put in windows that don't quite work. There's a variety of things you can do. I don't, I don't want to overstate this problem, the asset risk problem. But investors do take a serious look at it. And then this is a big one. The engineer tells you, you make the following five improvements, and you're going to 34% decrease in energy use, but when you actually go and measure it, it's 27%. That's a real problem for a financial model for an investor. He or she wants to know, are you really going to get 34%? Because if you don't, and I'm six percentage points below that, this investment doesn't look very good. So there's, again, just like we saw the policy tools to stimulate demand, there's a whole set of tools to stimulate efficiency investment. I'm going to go through these fast because I want to be sure we have some time for questions. The first are energy efficiency tax credits. Not many people know that they exist. They're pretty modest, but they do, or I should say, they did exist. When the solar and wind tax credits were extended, there are the orphan tax credits that didn't get extended. Geothermal, biomass, energy efficiency, all of these got left on the cutting room floor. The only ones that got extended were solar and wind. The orphan tax credits, and this is one of them, was a really unfortunate result. And there's all sorts of finger pointing about why it happened. But the, what we need to do is in this current tax discussion in Washington. We should put these orphan credits back in place like we did solar and wind. All right. These are complicated, so I'm going to go through them fast. There's lots of ways to make it easier for people to renovate in an energy efficient way, either a residential or commercial building. One is let them pay it back on their energy bill, their electricity bill. 
Give them a loan, and this is a monthly payment they make anyway. Put it on that bill, and that can help the investor say, aha, I have, I have a better assurance that this is actually going to get paid. Another one, property assessed clean energy, is put it on the annual property tax bill. Essentially float the loan and have it paid back on the property tax bill. We call that PACE and there's something called the PACE assessment. Lots of complexities in this one. It works in the commercial space, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have problems in the residential area. I won't get into it, but it's an interesting concept and it's getting some traction. This is one of my favorites called energy savings performance contracts. This is where big companies, you've probably heard of a company like Honeywell, it takes its own money, goes into a building commercial building are, and, and frequently a federal building, does the energy retrofit under a contract and pays itself back, well, let me say it this way, the, the company that owns the building or the federal agency pays this back but has already achieved some savings. So this is the debt service and this is the reduced energy bill, but it's already saving and then when the contract is over, when Honeywell has been fully paid back, you have a big, a much reduced energy bill. So the company puts the money in and it essentially pays itself back out of the savings and the owner of the building five or 10 years later gets a vastly cheaper building to operate. Utilities also do something like this, a version of the ESPC is called utility energy service contracts. And then this last one is a purely private sector approach that's being advanced by a variety of companies. One is a small one in Washington, D.C. called Spark Fund. Actually, some students who came out of Middlebury and Dartmouth who set this company up a few years ago and is doing very, very well with something called a technology subscription service. And they've got lots, they've raised lots of money and they've got lots of clients. So yet another approach to this. Now, the exciting thing for me, because this is where things get really well integrated was when Solar City announced we're coming over to your house anyway why don't we also do the energy efficiency upgrade Lyndon Rye the CEO says our goal is to manage all the energy needs of the home they got a they got a loan from a bank in Boston and they started to do this Unfortunately, nine months later, they gave up on it because they realized that unlike putting panels on the roof, going in and doing efficiency retrofits to homes was a lot more complicated. Every home is different. And it just was taking time and money they couldn't spend. And they didn't say this, but of course, if you cut the electricity load in a home, What's happens to your solar panel sales? So that didn't work very well for Solar City either. So this was a bright and shining moment, but I think we can get back to this. I think there are ways to do it, and I, and I, and I think that's ultimately providing an integrated solution. Solar on the roof, that new furnace in the basement, insulation in the walls. There's a whole variety of ways to do that. This state has an, the first energy efficiency utility, Efficiency Vermont that has been pioneering a lot of very important mechanisms for getting this done. The state public service board, the public utility commission, you have current and former commissioners sitting here, done a lot of very creative things to get things done in this way. So I would give Vermont a lot of credit for being a very pioneering state when it comes to what we can do with energy efficiency. And then the last one, is the biggest user of energy of all on the planet, and that is the US federal government. $23 billion energy bill, 400,000 buildings, even more vehicles, lots and lots of energy efficiency tools, federal procurement, federal finance, technology demonstrations, these energy savings performance contracts, a whole host of other things. I was co-chaired a report last year that we submitted to the Secretary of Energy about all these opportunities in federal energy management to pioneer 
some of the things we be, need to be able to do in energy efficiency. And I did a piece in The Hill just after Trump was elected saying, as president, Trump will be CEO of US Energy Incorporated. And I pointed out to the president, I don't think he read it, but he owned a mere 2 million square feet of real estate. He was now taking over an empire with 3 billion square feet of real estate. And I thought it was a great opportunity for the president to step up, take a look at this report we did, and really do some great things in the federal context. So the biggest economic opportunity of the 21st century, and the way I will leave this for you is, it's an unprecedented chance to do good and do well. And I think it's that intersection that's going to motivate people more than anything else when it comes to moving the unprecedented amounts of capital that it's going to have to start flowing if we're going to fix this problem. So don't forget the triangle as you go out. And with that, I thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Don't be shy. Please. Hi, my name is Margaret Schubert. I'm on VGEL um, as a second year student. Um, thank you for this incredible presentation. Um, regarding your tattoo or that energy triangle, um, <laughs> at a school where we're really focused on policy and we have a lot of great guidance, um, how do we then branch out to the other two? And outside of just reading or even going to conferences, but making connections and having relationships with people who are really active in those realms. So I think one of the interesting opportunities, and I've spoken some to your new dean and president, there's a lot going on in, in, in energy engineering and technology over at Dartmouth, and there's a very good business school. So I think one of the things that this school can be doing more of, and I think both schools are interested, is trying to integrate a bit around that triangle, you know, with 20 miles or whatever it is down the road. So that's a that's kind of a short term, I mean not a short term, but in you know, a close by opportunity. And then I think that, you know, summer opportunities, there are lots and lots of law firms that are doing environmental law, but I can't tell you the number of them that also have an entire practice focused on going out and developing and financing clean energy projects or going out and developing and financing energy efficiency installations. So uh, those practices are growing very, very quickly. So in a law firm, there are lots and lots of NGOs now that have gotten very interested in this whole area of, of clean energy finance. So again, in almost any of these contexts, you can see these things coming together. Thank you. Can you hear me? There we go. Utilities tend to collect uh, their revenues through volumetric sales, and energy efficiency reduces the volume of electricity. Could you discuss that uh, perverse incentive and ways to get around that? So the issue is, you know, traditionally you make money if you're a utility by sale selling more electricity, so how the heck do you um, step up to a need called energy efficiency that's going to reduce your going to reduce your earnings. And there's been lots and lots of experiments and lots and lots of things put into place. You know, these whole, this whole world of, of restructuring of electricity markets in various states um, has gotten us to a situation where you make sure that utilities can, in fact, see some upside to cutting electricity use. So California has done things like that, Massachusetts, Vermont. There's a whole host of ways that we've restructured our approach. Public utility commissions and state legislatures have restructured the approach so that utilities do have greater incentive. And there's lots of professors in here who know this far better than I do, but it is a very, very important question. And, you know, we've had varying degrees of success in making it happen. And there are some states where it hasn't happened yet, and that's why they're often the states that have white spaces on the map where efficiency has not seen much uptake. So, like broadly, I wanted to ask about the uh, the risks that 
companies and private institutions see in investing in energy efficiency. But also wanted to ask you if you have any experience with or have seen any uh, public bonding or, or other mechanisms to invest in energy efficiency through partnerships with the with distributed utilities or distribution utilities to actually uh, use kind of public dollars or or public private partnership dollars to invest in that so that there's not so much concern about as you mentioned like a 34 percent reduction in energy use becoming a 27 percent reduction you know less concern about uh, return to shareholders good it's a good question and let me just say one thing when when we talk about 50 trillion dollars that's going to have to be invested i just want to emphasize the vast 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 proportion of that is going to be private money you look at the green climate fund that was committed to the developing world that's a hundred billion dollar fund it's only at 11 billion right now the u.s has walked away so we're not going to do a lot of this on the back of public money but public money is quite essential public money can really put oil in the gears of things that might not otherwise work. So it's not so much that public dollars are going to flow into just the basic financing of big projects, but can buy down risk, as you say. There are, there are very innovative ways um, where public dollars can kind of take the risk out of a project in various ways. And in a paper we're putting together, we, we walk through many of those mechanisms that, that, that can be used to essentially take that risk out of the, the fall from 33% to 27% and get investors to a place where they're willing to put some, some money in a project. I'm not going to go into the details because we don't have time, but there's great things we can do with public dollars. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you so much for being here and the previous work that you've done on behalf of uh, energy and efficiency. Um, I'm Tim Yarrow, 2002 graduate from law school. You had uh, touched on the unknown factors, the present executive administration, somewhat allergic to facts and science, etc. But my question is somewhat twofold. How important is the executive administration to either support or detract from process towards energy efficiency? In other words, can they really get in the way and gum up the works or are there other forces at work here, either through Congress or the courts or the market forces that can continue to allow steady, predictable progress? So they can get in the way very significantly. And the easy example, as I gave, is if they don't end up putting out these energy efficiency standards, if they pull back on the CAFE numbers. Even within the clean power plan, as many of you know, energy efficiency is, is one of the ways to meet clean power plan beyond the fence line mandates. So even in, even in that context, so these big three standards, an administration that's not committed to them, if we end up in that place, can do major, major, major damage. Um, this, this smaller example, but one that I think is important nonetheless, you know, the federal government should be a leader, not a laggard in its own facilities, these 400,000 buildings. And there was some real momentum, a, a very important executive order that was issued by President Obama that was really pushing out strongly to get, make these federal buildings the most energy efficient in the country. And not just that, but use federal facilities, federal buildings as technology test beds. The Department of Defense has a very advanced one. And the General Services Administration, which owns most of the non-DOD buildings in the United States, a very impressive technology test bed so that private companies could go into these federal buildings and try stuff out before they try it out on the commercial sector. So now, is Congress going to rescue us? Right. I, I'm not optimistic. Um, but can the states continue down this road? I think they can. And I talked a little bit about that. And there's plenty of states in a position to do that. Finally. We have gotten to such a point when it comes to, to the economic opportunities around clean energy that I think it's the private sector that said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. We're making money at this stuff. So, and, and, and I think that could be the greatest savior of what we're trying to do here. I said the last. Now the real last 
is a competitive opportunity that we really risk giving up, which is with other countries. The Chinese have decided in their multiple five-year plans, the 13th being the latest, that they want to own this clean energy space. And they have a very organized effort to do so. <clears throat> and to the extent we pull back as a country on a lot of technologies that were invented here, and in fact, many which were paid for by US taxpayers, the extent we pull back, we're giving up a big economic opportunity. And I think the private sector understands that. And I think there are a number of people in government who do as well. So that's kind of the argument I try to make on Capitol Hill with a climate denier, as it were, a senator or a congressperson, say, listen, let's not talk about climate. Do you really want to put us that far behind when it comes to this vast economic opportunity that we just talked about? That's what you're doing. And you're sacrificing US taxpayer investment in the technologies that the Chinese now lead on. We put out a report last spring at Stanford about the Chinese solar industry, funded by DOE. I encourage you to read it, because we are getting our butts kicked by the Chinese when it comes to solar. The only thing we've got left is decent deployment. They're getting really good at R&D. We still lead in R&D, but they are catching up very, very fast. They have a very organized effort to take over global solar R&D. And we don't manufacture much anymore. So one more question, then we're done. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Dom Jovenel. I'm a 1L here. And uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania and living you know, 10 minutes from Three Mile Island. And the <clears throat> recent development of natural gas in our state has created this enormous energy discussion. But a sector that's often overlooked is agriculture being our number one industry in Pennsylvania and the energy and efficiency that that sector consumes with 30% of global energy consumption stemming from agriculture. So how do you believe we make that switch? Because obviously Americans love to eat and so does the world to a more efficient agriculture sector that uses energy in a more efficient energy or even less energy. Yeah, ag sector, big opportunity. It sounds like it's something you know a lot about. I know less, but I will tell you that the, the bioenergy sector, a piece of the ag sector, it's kind of gotten, has a, has a mixed reputation, but from biofuels to biopower, go up to Burlington to the, the biomass power plant there, to biomaterials, bioprocessing, there's a lot we can do to essentially find substitutes for hydrocarbons that can come out of the chemistry of things biological. So I, I, I still have great hopes for that sector, and there's still some real progress being made. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for that fascinating talk, and let's seize the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we're going to take about a five-minute break, so get some refreshments, use the bathroom, and we will re uh, reconvene at 10.05 for the next panel. <laughs>